Good afternoon. Um, so let's start uh, immediately with who I am. We'll go back to the title. So by passion, I'm a developer and an architect. I've been developing for quite a while. By title, I'm a CEO and CTO, in this case of my own company. By nature, I'm curious about everything. Uh, and in reality, I'm basically the company handyman. Whatever needs to be done, uh, I'll do it. So going back to the title, um, this is a small overview of some of the problems you find when uh, designing for microservices and designing scalable applications, not just in terms of the architecture, but also in terms of the impact it has on the teams. So, I don't see, I don't know if you guys can see it, but those are my contacts. If you want to take a note, I'll post the slides uh, later. So, the objectives, it's talking a little bit about the monolith architecture, so traditional architectures and applications, um, the methodologies we started adopting for startups and why, um, why we change them, uh, how you need to change your way of thinking when you're thinking about microservices, the impact it has on your team, and then I'll leave some room for questions. So. A small uh, brief history, and before we start with this, uh, how many of you are actually JavaScript programmers? Okay, cool. How many have been programmers for more than five years? Good. So, traditionally, uh, when we, in many companies, when they think about an application, they think about uh, the functionality they want to have. They build a small uh, application in the beginning um, with some kind of storage for the data. And initially, they would put it in a bare metal uh, machine, in a physical machine in a data center somewhere. Uh, then when your application grows, you basically separate your data layer to an, a different server and keep the, the one you have for application. Uh, then if you grow a little bit more, you end up going to structures like this, which basically poses a problem. So we have, for example, the first app machine has like 50% of load. The second one has 10, the third one has 40. So there's a lot of resources that um, are in those machines that are not being used. Um, so gradually the industry moved to virtual machines. So you can have your code running on a small uh, machine and you can put several of those machines in the same uh, server. So you can a bit reuse the, um, the space that you have. This is all fine, but it also causes quite a bit uh, of problems, especially when you want to move uh, to manage uh, several versions of the same application that might imply different versions of uh, operating systems, libraries, runtimes, uh, kind of becomes a mess and the images are quite big to upload and start a new server uh, with images. So when the startup methodology came along, so the idea is that you take a small idea, you build something really quick, uh, the so-called MVP, test it uh, the fast, the, as fast as you can, um, and that doesn't leave that much uh, space for uh, other things, like thinking of architecture. So people normally have um, an idea, they explain the idea, they find a programmer or someone to put some code together, they come up with a MVP, and then at the end you end up with something similar to this. 
So you have your storage for your files, your databases and replication, your cache servers, and then you have a VM that basically has your whole application, an operating system, a kernel, um, the runtime, uh, all the frameworks and libraries that you need in whatever versions uh, that you need, um, and then all your services and front-end uh, or front-end facing uh, services like APIs, front-ends. So you grow your team a little bit more and then you find bugs, you fix them with a very thorough project process and everything is okay, right? Not really. So updates involve basically updating your entire virtual machine uh, if you do it correctly. Um, it's difficult to manage multiple versions, uh, the same uh, applications running on the same server, um, do stuff like A-B testing. Uh, the payloads going into new virtual machines are quite big because you're packaging your application plus uh, your operating systems with everything that you need and the, the stuff that you don't need. Um, then you have other problems like network configuration, zone, creating zones for virtual machines is hard, especially if you're talking about going multi-cluster um, or going multi-zone, so having two different clusters and two different uh, availability zones. Uh, it becomes quite hard to manage all this. Um, and on top of all that, uh, with time, you end up having different versions uh, of libraries, applications, OSs, and everything in your developer machines, which makes quite a big uh, problem to manage, especially when you go to, to production. So people started going to containers. Uh, why? So with containers, you have uh, preferably a very, very light uh, host system. Um, you have a, a small container engine. Uh, and then you just have your binaries, your libraries, and your application running in that container. So basically, containers isolate processes. You have a process thinking that it has the whole machine. It can run everything it wants inside. Um, but you don't need to basically package your application with the entire OS and uh, all of this. This makes like mach virtual machines to set up, uh, they might take minutes, uh, containers might take seconds uh, to be up and running. There are several types of uh, containers. In this case, I'm going to focus on uh, Docker. but. Why containers? Most of them are uh, one of the biggest reasons is because they are portable. You can use them in your development environment, but you can run very, very similar containers on production. Huh. Okay. So in the beginning, you think it's easy. Um, it's going to be easy. It's just application, putting it inside a container. Well, in reality, it's more or less like this. So you try, you will fail a few times. And this is why it's hard. Like, if you start separating your applications into multiple containers, uh, they might live or not in the same machine. So uh, you start facing problems like, how do those containers talk to each other? So networking, file system as well. So not only you're going to be uh, in development, for example, you're going to be using your local file system to store the files, but for example, if you go to the cloud, or if you move to production, you don't want to have uh, your files hosted within your uh, container. Um, otherwise, you might lose it. So there's quite a, f a few challenges when you move to, to containers. So there are things to have uh, in mind, like you have several nodes, how those nodes talk to each other, how does con the containers inside those nodes talk to each other, uh, how do you manage those, um, those containers, 
um, how do you manage service, service brokers, containers, networks, load balancers, well, the list goes on. Um, there's quite a few things. So it's important to know that the containers have a, a, a philosophy, same as more or less uh, Linux, that each program does one specific thing and does it very well. So the same is for the containers. So the containers should do, should have one app and all the necessary things for that app, but nothing else. Like if your app doesn't need to write or read anything from the disk, you don't need drivers to write and read uh, and read for the, from those uh, types of devices. Um, again, should do one task and do it well. The app should be isolated. So you shouldn't have two apps running in the same container. Um, it should allow, it allows to communication, but uh, it might be hard depending on what you're trying to do. Um, and it's re really, really uh, light. So you can, from nothing, create a new image and have a new server running in one, two minutes. Um, and containers should be ephemeral. So for those that don't know what this means, it means that they might last for uh, a very, very short time. So the container might be there, but uh, in the second after that, it might not be there. So uh, you need to take into account a few other things, um, like how do you provision containers dynamically? Um, and there's quite a few differences uh, not just on the containers, but especially on the ways that they communicate and that they are aware of other containers. In development, it's more or less simple. You create, for example, three containers, one for your app, one for your cache, one for your database system. You link them together. It works fine. Uh, but when you go to production, then you have stuff like service load balancers, so internal load balancers, uh, elastic load balancers in the case of uh, Amazon or Google. Uh, so the public load balancers, you need, uh, you have your app containers. If they go down, you need to automatically uh, create new containers um, and automatically uh, connect them together. So there's a bit of a similarity in abstract concepts. So uh, we have the concept of a library or a repository um, in programming, the same way uh, we have a repository for Docker, for example. It's just a place where you store the definition of your uh, containers. Um, have a concept of a blueprint in programming, we can call it a class, it's just a model of how you make a certain object. Uh, in Docker, this is called a Docker image. It's what you basically produce with the code you store in the repository. Um, and uh, you have objects or in programming instances of a class, which um, in Docker terms, that would be the container, the actual container that you build from that image that you store in this repository. So those are, these are some of the things that you should keep in mind. Uh, Docker, what is a Docker image? Where is a repository, a container? Uh, Docker link is just a tool, is a way that you link uh, Docker containers uh, together. So thinking about microservices, um, the service should be a unique uh, functionality. Like your service shouldn't try and do everything at the same time. Uh, it shouldn't take coffee and make ice cream at the same time. Either it does one thing or it does another. Um, and it should be um, as much isolated as possible. So um, think of your, if you think about breaking down an application, you break it into modules because it's easier to manage. So if you have a very, very big application, you basically, 
in theory, you can basically take those modules and make services, independent services out of it. Um, this allows you for um, having, first of all, a common API uh, to manage interactions with several uh, services and allows you for having parts of your application uh, not available when you're doing maintenance or uh, other stuff and still have the application uh, as a whole uh, running, for example. If Hello? It shouldn't be a problem, for example, for an e-commerce system if the mail service doesn't work. The shop is working, so, so it should be working. Um, yeah, that was just the example I gave. So services uh, can be scaled independently. So if I have a service for my catalog, I can scale that service and not scale the payment system because I don't need it. Um, they can be exposed publicly or just used internally to other services. Um, they can run several versions at the same time. You can do stuff like uh, A-B testing and other things quite easily. Um, and in general, they are uh, small and easier to maintain than bigger uh, applications. So it, this all looks fine, but there are times where you don't want to uh, use uh, microservices. When, when you have a very, very small app, doesn't make sense. You're introducing tons of complexity. Uh, and managing containers and everything. You can do it in one machine, do it. Um, if you just have a few hundred users, well, it's not gonna scale that much, so you don't need to worry about it. Um, if you need audit trails, by, by the services being separated, it's a little bit more complicated to follow a business process and uh, make an audit of all the steps along the way. So there are ways to go around this and use microservices, keeping that, those audit trails. But um, in general, if you're building something that needs audit trails, um, thinking out of the bat on using microservices might not be the best idea. Or if you're a really, really small team uh, working on a small project, it actually doesn't make sense. So there are quite a few challenges uh, on moving from virtual machines to containers. Like with containers, you, you need way more orchestration uh, than, than you need uh, when dealing with one virtual machine. Um, they might be different as well. Uh, they need different things when they're running into production or uh, dev. Um, you need to manage service discovery and network mapping. Um, you need to worry about uh, stuff like resilience, resilience uh, auto scaling, uh, auto scaling across regions. So there are ways to do this really quick. Um, I'm just giving you guys a, an overview. So there's systems like CoreOS or Mini Deb. Uh, or even a version of Ubuntu that are specifically designed for running uh, containers. There are really, really slim versions of the operating system, uh, which makes the host run quite uh, faster. There's several types of containers. I've been talking about Docker, but there's uh, other types like Linux containers or Rocket containers. They, in theory, they are basically the same thing. They're just different interpretations of it. And then you need some kind of tool to manage your infrastructure, to know where to put the containers, uh, what containers to vision, how to deal with those containers, uh, mapping network and everything. So there's several tools for that. Kubernetes, Mesos, Docker Swarm. Um, there's a ton of them. Um, my choice. Uh, because it runs on all the major clouds. Um, it's completely open source. It runs on premises and bare metal. So if I have my own uh, servers uh, cluster or my own bare metal servers, I can run on it. Um, and it's easy to install. Uh, 
yeah, even runs on a Raspberry Pi, it's Kubernetes. So this is the basic structure. So basically you have a node that controls all the other machines and then you have your containers running inside of each node. Um, so this has an impact on your team. So you have more, more code repositories, so one per service at least. Um, you need to enforce more strict rules when you commit uh, because you might break a service that might uh, have a dependency on another service, so you need to be careful with that. Um, you should never touch the containers. Uh, another difference is normally you don't do SSH into the container, so the process of deploying and managing the containers should be completely automated by continuous uh, integration and delivery systems. Um, and yeah, you need to create startup scripts for uh, easy onboarding, like how to set up your environments on dev machines really, really uh, quick. Another one is, since you never know the actual address of your services, um, you need to load uh, all your dependencies, uh, preferably through environment variables, so you can have your uh, know where your database is, what it's the actual address. Even if the database goes completely down and someone puts it back up, uh, it might have a different IP address or something like that, and you need to discover that. So, so you need to automate uh, and manage uh, deploys in a uniform um, meta. Uh, get the repos um, uh, releases uh, that everyone in your organization can access. So you should have your images stored somewhere where your developers can pull another version of the container if they need to update their environment. Um, need to be careful because some things, as I mentioned before, like storage and so forth, change from development to production. You need to account for that. So for those things, and if you use Kubernetes, there's something that, in terms of JavaScript, it would uh, compare more or less to NPM. So Helm is basically a package manager for Kubernetes. You can package your applications and just deploy them uh, as you need and configure them. Like, I want two or five or 10 instances of this uh, instance. 